Western University Medical School graduate Alan P. Winnie has served mankind and the specialty of anesthesia with a dedication and perseverance that goes far beyond the lyrics of his alma mater. Alan's enthusiasm for medicine was evident early on when his rotating internship at Cook County Hospital exposed him to anesthesiology for the first time. I found that I enjoyed caring for patients during the physical and emotional stress of surgery and I particularly enjoyed the ability to control the patient's physiology pharmacologically during this period of stress. The life and career of this eager young doctor was changed forever when Alan was suddenly stricken with poliomyelitis at the age of 26. His first reaction was one of denial. To this day, occasionally in my dreams, not only can I still walk, but if I encounter one of the physicians who treated me, I quickly sit down in my wheelchair so they won't know that I can walk. Over the next few months of recovery on a Merck ventilator and a rocking bed to help him breathe, Alan's denial gradually gave way to acceptance. Expressing his thoughts in verse, the gifted poet contemplated his future as he gazed out the hospital window. The sad white eye of this new night cries myriads of auto tears that crisscross over its many streeted face the freckles of which glow dimly and disappear one by one as an angry lock of cloud slips down and covers sad eye rendered even sadder by the loss of lights. Yet soon the bright orange eye of day combs back the clouds, revealing life and lives, breathing happiness in little gray blue puffs from cigarette chimneys as the city yawns a sleepy but happy to be alive yawn and readies itself for this new day of life on wheels. After several more months of rehabilitation, Allen decided to go back to Cook County Hospital to see if he could function as an anesthesiologist in a wheelchair. He could, and he did. When you have a handicap, there are many things you can do that appear impossible if you can find a unique way of doing it or, in selected instances, if you can get someone to help you do it. This need redefines the meaning of friendship. You can do anything you want if you're willing to lean on your friends. With a little help, Alan has triumphed over his physical limitations with an astonishing career that defines the history of regional anesthesia. His groundbreaking concept of plexus anesthesia has led to many new techniques of pain management, and his award-winning book on the subject is just one of more than a hundred publications he has authored. Allen has served in many prominent staff and academic positions in the Chicago area, and has received numerous awards and honors. Much of his time has been devoted to specialty societies, including the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, where he was a founding member and president for five years. He's also been the driving force behind the Dana Miller Memorial Educational Foundation since the death of his close friend, Dr. Joseph Dana Miller, in 1984. In addition to his professional accomplishments, Alan is a family man with three children and five grandchildren. He has somehow found the time to lead Cub Scouts, coach Little League, and travel extensively. In fact, there seems to be little that Alan cannot do. Though proud of his achievements in anesthesiology, Alan Winnie places the utmost importance on personal relationships. Categorically, the greatest accomplishment 
is the education and training of a multitude of young anesthesiologists. The greatest reward of academic anesthesia, however, is unquestionably the many friendships that one develops throughout the world. Throughout his entire distinguished career, Dr. Alan P. Winnie has maintained lifelong friendships while working tirelessly for the benefit of his fellow man, epitomizing the values set forth long ago at his beloved alma mater. With body and with mind, we will serve mankind and Northwestern University. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kenneth Candido, professor and chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology at Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago. We're here in Park Ridge, Illinois, at the Paul Wood Museum Library of the American Society of Anesthesiology Headquarters to conduct a John Pender Living History of Anesthesiology Legends. Today's interview will be regarding Professor Alan P. Winnie, my mentor and former chairman and professor, both at the University of Illinois as well as at Cook County Medical Center in Chicago. In addition to being my mentor and former chairman, Dr. Winnie has been a mentor to many students of anesthesiology over the years and over the decades. His contributions are legendary and include more than 101 peer-reviewed publications of original topics of interest in anesthesiology, more than 25 original book, book chapters in medical textbooks, more than 38 abstracts, and multiple videos and books as well. I'm proud to introduce Professor Alan P. Winnie for this Living History of Anesthesiology interview. Good afternoon, Ken. Dr. Winnie, I know you were born on May 16, 1932, near Whitefish Bay in Wisconsin. Can you tell us a bit about your early childhood and what your most memorable events were as you were growing up? Yeah, I don't think uh, the hospital was in Whitefish Bay, but I was living in Whitefish Bay, which is a suburb of Milwaukee, and it was the, right in the depth of the depression so I had a nothing but upwards to go and uh, I was blessed uh, much of my career and the pitfalls of my career uh, were born for several reasons but one of them was that I grew up in, in an idyllic family setting I was fortunate my mom and dad were in love till they both died and they died 40 years apart. I had a brother, two years older. Unfortunately, he died when he was 23 of a very aneurysm. But we were really a great family. Furthermore, it was even better because my dad was the voice of the Green Bay Packers from 1929 to 1946. So he was a real well-known person in Milwaukee and uh, I got to be treated just because I was Russ Winnie's son I got treated really well when we got to that age when you want to go to a movie or you want to go to see something we always got tickets we were treated really well but I think this this home background uh, was wonderful and really set the stage for life my dad I said he was an announcer, but he kind of pushed me towards anesthesia all of my life, or towards uh, medicine all my life, I mean, uh, because he said he would really wanted to be a doctor, but at the time of the Depression, uh, he graduated in 1929 from the University of Wisconsin, so that was when the crash took place, and uh, I had a great beginning. My understanding is is that in addition to the Packers, he also was an announcer for uh, the Badgers and, and did some golf and some other Wisconsin, sports. Wisconsin, yeah. When he started, uh, he announced every sport there was. Can you imagine? There was no television. Radio was brand new. And everybody listened to things like the Golden Gloves boxing, golf. Imagine golf on radio, how exciting that is. Tennis, wrestling, uh, football. Uh, baseball, basketball, all of it. And I got to go with him on many of his trips. And once I even served as his sponsor, spotter, because my mother couldn't go at the time. My mother served as his spotter 
uh, the person who keeps you knowing who's in the game and who's going out of the game. They had a very clever system. But there are no women allowed in the press box, so he always introduced her as George and got away with it. Gee, Dr. Winnie, I'm sure that with your dad working as he did for the Green Bay Packers, you got to meet Curly Lambeau, for example, one of the founding fathers of the National Football League, and I have no doubt you also met some of the pro professional football players of the Packers and maybe other teams. What was that like, getting to interact with these guys? Did you, did you sit with them on the team bus? Did you go with them on team meetings? I'd like to know about that as well. It was fantastic. I actually swam in front of Curry Lambeau's Malibu Beach home, my brother and I, and uh, one of my dad's radio announcers went to Hollywood and became a big star, made movies that our, our generation only knew, like God is my co-pilot, things like that, and we got to go out there. Uh, we really had some wonderful, wonderful doors open to us through my dad and my mom. Nobody knows it, but the Packers, uh, up through about 1942, were broke. They, one year, were about to drop out of the NFL because they didn't have the $500 it took to be in it. And so when they played in Milwaukee, somebody talked them into playing two games in Milwaukee, which in Green Bay they didn't like. But in Green Bay, the, the stands they played at, which were high school stands, only seated like 600 people. And in Milwaukee, it seated 20,000 people. So they would actually change into their uniforms at the hotel downtown, and then private automobiles, and fortunately my dad was one of those, would pick them up and drive them to the, to the playing grounds. So I remember sitting on the lap of the, the quarterback, or the famous Don Hudson, who until today still holds records and passes caught and things like that. Yeah, it was a very exciting part of my life. Well, having grown up with your dad involved in all these professional sporting activities, Dr. Winnie, did you yourself have the inclination that you'd be a professional athlete at some point? No, I loved football. Played it like everybody in high school. Uh, I was played a guard. And basketball, I had a brilliant senior year. I was the high scorer until the middle of the season. And they cut, they benched me for reasons I never found out and tennis, I was on the tennis team. But no, I never, I never went out for those things in college. They, I thought I had bigger things to do. How did you go from being a small town Midwestern guy to joining one of the most glamorous and magnificent uh, Ivy League universities over on the East Coast, Princeton University, when you did? Well, when these schools sort of woo you, recruit you, uh, I went to a school, a Milwaukee Country Day School, that about 95% of them go east to the Ivy League, for better or for worse. And uh, nobody was going to Princeton but me, and Harvard, Princeton, and Yale were kind of then the big three. And uh, I thought this would be a time for me to get out on my own, make new friends, and uh, knowing it's a great institution, uh, and it, it is a great institution, and it gave me an enormous background. Uh, it, it's interesting that Milwaukee Country Day was so difficult that my first two years at Princeton, we didn't have to do much work because we'd already taken those courses. Whereas the kids from the public high schools were working their tails off, and I'm told about middle of the sophomore year, they usually pass these private school kids. Uh, but Princeton did well by me. Uh, both, probably the most important, one of the important events in my life happened at Princeton. Uh, and I owe Princeton that. I left Princeton saying I wouldn't send one of my children there because they did not have a counseling system. And college is really a place to grow up, a place to learn to get along with people and to interact and to live with yourself and find out who you are. And I happened to be chosen, one of 30 people, to go to Princeton. 
we got a phone call asking if they would study us. A man had named, named Roy Heath had a grant from the Carnegie Institute to study the influence of college on the human mind. So I was one of the subjects, and he came out and met each and every one of the 30 families. And then there was a control group that didn't get any uh, interviews with him. But all the way through Princeton, every two weeks, I would go and have an hour with Roy Heath. And without going into details, the end of my junior year, I came in and I said, Mr. Heath, uh, I don't know why I'm here, but I know I'm not the person I'm pretending to be. And what I guess I was saying is, you know, that some of the things I really liked deep down, like writing poetry and music and that sort of thing, that was sissy stuff. You know, so I was, although I was in Princeton Triangle Theater Group, which is one of my first loves, was theater. Uh, still, he responded by saying, oh, Alan, I've been waiting for three years to hear you say that. He picked up the phone, called my dad, and said, Alan will be home two weeks late this year. We're going to work together. And I've totally repressed what we did for those two weeks. But I came out of it a different person. And it, his, whatever he did to me is how I got past the really crushing obstacles. Some great guy and made up for a school that didn't believe in counseling. We had the highest suicide rate in the world for a college because everybody was chosen from the top 10% of their class, except if you look it up for me. And, of course, when they all get together, out of that group, they can't all be in the top 10% of their, uh, their class. And the counseling was so desperate that as those of us in the study went through, we finally sent our roommates to, with their problems to see who became Dr. Heath, actually, ultimately. Uh, we'd send friends. Guys have problems. And we didn't have girls there then. Maybe that's one of the problems. But, uh, and he took care of all of them. And they, our class dedicated their yearbook to him. And strangely enough, the president who had said, oh, they got to sink or swim sometime when confronted with the suicide problem. Mr. Heath, when he got, or Dr. Heath, when he got the award as our class's hero, lost his job the next year. But he went on to greater things and published the study in two books that were on the New York bestseller list for uh, about eight years. But it was a good experience in terms of what I learned it was fantastic. It's a great teaching institution. And today, I think they have overcome all of those problems. They've got good counseling and, and to have females as well. Dr. Winnie, your, coll your collegiate history included a great deal of emphasis on poems, poetry, the arts, the theater. Did any of this in any way influence your choice of a medical career, including anesthesiology and pain medicine, for example? I don't think that interest came until I was, I mean, specifically in that area until I was through with medical school. Obviously, graduating from Princeton University, you could cherry pick any medical university in the entire nation, probably in the world for that matter. What was it about Northwestern University that called you back to the Midwest to complete your medical education there? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, my graduating class of pre-meds, we used to say 50% 50, 50 went to, to uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, and 50% went to New York to um, blocking the... Cornell? Cornell, yeah. And uh, a small group went to Flower Fifth Avenue, which was tough to get uh, into. 
What happened to me is I had signed up for Penn. And the Penn people, guys who went to Penn were a very different group than the guys who went to Cardell. I don't know what that difference was, but it seemed like we were all buddies that went to Pennsylvania. I got a phone call from my dad, and you're right, it was easy. I mean, uh, I had an advantage because I was offered positions at uh, Yale and um, Northwestern and two or three others. Uh, I couldn't go to Yale because they don't give an exam until your last day of school. I need to take exams. I'm a crammer. Uh, I'd signed up at Penn, and my dad called up and said, you know, Alan, he said, uh, it would save us a lot of money, because he paid every penny of my tuition. And he said, if you could maybe, have you turned down Northwestern yet? And I said, no. And he said, would it be okay if you went to Northwestern? because it's so close to Milwaukee. And I said, of course it's okay. So I came to Northwestern, which was fortuitous, I believe, uh, in so many ways. First, being close to home, my dad died while I was in med school. My brother died just before him. Uh, so it was good that I was there, uh, close to them, close to family. Uh, and at that time, I must say, Northwestern was a great school. I looked in, in a booklet put out every year by, at that time, the Rice Institute that ranked colleges. And it was in the top 10, along with a lot of other great schools. But um, I think uh, Northwestern was a shadow of what it is today. Uh, they've really, really come a long way. But I learned, I enjoyed Northwestern. Uh, I. My Princeton background made science relatively easy for me. And what I enjoyed, enjoyed most at Northwestern, it gave me time. Uh, we put on, every year I was there, we put on a musical comedy, which was fully written and acted and directed and choreographed by us students. And um, it's called Quo Vadis Medicus name given to it by the chairman of the, the uh, anatomy department who said, name it Quo Vadis Medicus. Where the hell do you think you're going, doctor? And, uh, but that was really fun. Also the source of a lot of dates since I was the director. I got all their information. But seriously, it, it, it turned out to play a very important part of my life. Uh, I had to cram a lot harder when the exams came because we did a lot on, on the outside of medicine. And uh, I think, again, it strengthened me socially and, and, and educationally. But we got a great education there. Isn't it true that you wrote the alma mater for the Northwestern University Medical School program? How successful was that? We wrote in the second or third show, because uh, we wrote all the music and lyrics, and we wrote a alma mater for Northwestern Medical School. And it is beautiful, and it brings tears to your eyes. And it's, it, it, I wish we could, uh, I'm still gonna bug the president of the university or the medical school, see if I can't get, the, get him to do that. When you graduated, were you committed to staying locally um, to pursue your medical career in terms of residency, or did you have your sights set elsewhere? No. In those days, your clerkships, when you finally get into your clinical years, most of them were taken at Northwestern hospitals, either at, in those days, Passivant or Wesley, which were right across the street from each other and which were real rivals. Uh, Evanston Hospital was a Northwestern hospital. And I served clerkships and externships and so on at all of those. And then I was on a clerkship to Cook County. And I learned more in one month in Cook County than I learned anywhere else. We saw things that we weren't supposed to see. The last day, the last lecture we received, a formal lecture at med school, 
the lecturer, who had a column published every day in the Tribune, said, now today we will talk about those diseases which you'll never see, but you need to know about. And he proceeded to talk about Chuchikamuchi fever, and so on and so on and so on. I saw every single one of those diseases at Cook County Hospital. Now you have to remember, Cook County Hospital in those days had 3,200 beds. So we had a lot of material to learn on, and a lot of wonderful people who appreciated medicine and appreciated the doctors. We were their doctors. So it, uh, it just, with that, with that experience, uh, and, and the last thing we were told is we would benefit most if we went to one of the Northwestern hospitals where you'd learn not only the science but the art of anesthesia. Well, half the class went to Cook County Hospital were because they could see that if you, they, they, they literally said don't go to Cook County Hospital. That was the atmosphere. And uh, obviously it was a great place and it was a great time uh, compared to today because of the volumes of patients and the types of diseases. It was pretty exciting stuff. So now we're at approximately 1958, Dr. Winnie. You're a big, tall, strapping, athletic guy. You've got your medical education completed, you've got the world in the palm of your hand. What is it that makes you elect to do a super internship at Cook County Hospital? Yeah, they called it super internship because when you finish your internship, every, every service I was on, I loved it. You know, surgery, OB. I really thought I was going to go into OB at one time. Thank God I didn't. Um, Virtually everything, and you know, in, in your internships, you have to take certain courses surgery, OB, medicine, and peds, and you only got to do a couple of electives. And there were so many electives I wanted to do, and there was no such thing as a family practice residency or a general practice residency. So they would allow you if you wanted to, because I liked everything, didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, they'd let you take a second year, and in that year, you could choose any specialty you wanted, one month at a time, two months at a time, whatever you wanted. And I, I stayed there, and they were extremely rewarding. And it, by happenstance, I chose anesthesia because when I went through med school, because of a change in curriculum, I never got anesthesia at all. So I really knew nothing about it. Some still say I don't, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a great extra six months. So what I did was I took, I enlisted in the Air Force, and in which I was accepted, and uh, served on ophthalmology and anesthesia. Uh, in October, I was to report November 1st for active duty as a captain in the United States Air Force Medical Corps. Had a great assignment, I was told. Bowling Air Force Base right outside Washington where all the transatlantic flights go, so every weekend you get to go to a different country for nothing. It sounded pretty exciting. I was on ENT, and every morning we would start the day, the two interns, with a line of about 150 kids who had sore throats and colds and so on. And so you put the tongue blade in and they'd say, ah, and they'd choke and sputter and cough. And then you'd send them to this guy to take care of or this guy to take care of or send them home with whatever they needed and so on. And unfortunately, one of those kids coughed at me with a polio virus. And so uh, I, I woke up one morning and I remember feeling, funny feeling, I guess it's dysesthesia, where my clothes were and so on. I knew the night before uh, I had a date and I was pretty disinterested, which isn't like me. And uh, but this, bit, this feeling didn't go away. 
So I got up and I got dressed and I went to the head of the, the chairman of the medical department, chairman of the department of medicine, who at that time was also editor of the Journal of Medicine. I mean, county was full of those kinds of people. And I told him what I was feeling. And he looked at me and he said, Alan, you don't know what you have? I said, no, I don't know what I have. He said, well, go up to the infirmary and check in and I'll come up and we'll talk. And I got up to the infirmary and they gave me a muscle relaxant because backache was one of my severest symptoms other than the dysesthesias. But the mind is a powerful thing in terms of self-denial. I remember my roommate, we had a wild apartment together, came up to say, what's going on here? And I said, you know, Kelly, I, it's the craziest thing. I sat up and I said, when I get out of bed, I fall down. And I got out of bed and I fell down, which was pretty stupid. And he picked me up and put me back in bed. And then, of course, they told me it was polio. And, uh, you know, started to take care of me. And I went to the, um, they had a separate building of infectious disease built in 1875. And, uh, but from that, for a few days in there, I, of course, didn't remember anything. Uh, but I, I knew I was sick, and uh, I wasn't supposed to survive. But I, I proved them wrong. They put me, as a junior in medical school, I had gone out there, and that was two years after a big epidemic of polio. And they took us through the, the uh, infectious disease building and the ward in which I landed. And there were 55 iron lungs lined up in rows. And they told us how they worked and so on. Uh, and they're cumbersome things. You know, they're supposed to suck your chest up and let it down. And they said, would anybody like to get in one? I said, I'd love to. So I did get into an iron lung uh, just to try it. That same year, my junior year, they said, you know, there's a vaccine against polio. Dr. Salk has just invented. So I had, in my junior year, I had the Salk vaccine. My senior year, I got the supplemental two shots. So I was fully Salk vaccinated against polio. But some guys are just lucky. So I ended up in that same contagious unit which was devoid of iron lungs except one. On one end of this huge room was Mr. Hall with couches and chairs around him and a carpet under the iron lung. He had ALS and he'd been there for five years, which is long for ALS, but in an old iron lung. When, I, when they realized what I had, Dr. Merck, Trier Merck, who then was the chairman of anesthesia at County, came up with the one of the senior residents, who became a, was a very close friend of mine. And I remember them pulling a gooseneck lap over the bed and putting a drape over me. And I said, "What are you going to do?" And he said, you need a tracheotomy. You're moving less than 10% of your volume. And so I could hear them talking, and I'm not the senior or the surgical resident. I said, what are you going to use for anesthesia? He said, I'll give him some of this. Uh, county used to re reuse units. So if, if the procaine didn't get used, it was put back and re-autoclaved and put in another unit. Well, whatever they put in the my unit was autoclaved one too many times. And I can remember Dr. Merck saying to me, yeah, you're going to feel a couple of pinpricks now, which I did. And he said, wait a few minutes, he said, 
Howard, do you feel this? And he pinched me with a kelly. I said, ow, yeah. And then I heard Paul, a surgeon, Paul O'Brien, say to him, Dr. Murphy, don't do that. He's got sensation. And Merck said clearly, if the mountains won't come to Muhammad, Muhammad will go to the mountains, and he slipped my throat. And it's an interesting experience to be on the end of that, because one of the things we were taught in medical school is the nose humidifies, warms air, and so on. I got the coldest blast of air you ever, you can't imagine, which you get used to rapidly, of course. And the tracheotomy tube he put into me, in those days there was no plastic, was a, sterl a silver tube called the Merck tracheotomy tube. He would invented it. And the only difference between other trach tubes is you had a swivel on the end of it. Very clever. So that if somebody pulled on that tube, it didn't pull on you. It pulled, and you, you could swivel it around. Um, and then he connected me to the Merck piston ventilator. One of which, I think it's mine, they have here in the Wood Library Museum. And it was just a piston, went back and forth, pushing air. And he did something you don't do anymore that was, was a godsend. There's a lot that I don't remember, but I do remember that I could talk. Because today, everybody on the ventilators gets cuffed tubes. And his principle was, use an uncuffed tracheotomy tube. Set the volume big enough, not only to get the tidal volume you want in the patient, but give him an excess of a couple of hundred cc's. It'll rush out through his cords and he can talk. The only difference is you talk during inspiration instead of expiration. And that's a godsend. I mean, that you can talk, not try to write notes to people. Because many years later, I was on a cuff tube and I couldn't talk him into collapsing the cuff. But that was, uh, that was a real experience. It, it, but it, again, it was uh, retrospectively a good experience in terms of growing up and learning the life the way life really is. Dr. Winnie, I know that you were very at um, anxious to serve our country and join the military and in fact you had enlisted in the Air Force but right before that was about to come to fruition maybe within several weeks you were stricken with polio could you elaborate on that for us? I had trach I, I really had spinal bulbar poliomyelitis which meant that I was paralyzed all I could move was my eyeballs I could look left and right and up and down and slowly it started to go down a little bit. So I'm hoping I had Guillain-Barre syndrome and I might recover it completely. And then I gained the use of my arms and, uh, and it stopped descending. And polio, as you know, doesn't, it isn't like a traumatic uh, situation where it cuts the cord, it just, invade certain parts of the cord. So I've got some muscles on one side that I don't have on the other, but I never got back the legs. And they tried so hard, and when I finally got out of the hospital, to have me rehabilitate and walk on crutches and braces. And I can remember it would take me 10 minutes to walk 10 yards. And all the time, if I ever buckled forward, I'd fall. And there was no way to get up. And for the first six months out, I went home and lived with my mother in Milwaukee. I met a then very famous surgeon that happened to be friends of my mom and dad's, Walter Blount. And he came and looked me over and he said, Alan, I think you should forget about walking and get back to business of living and stay in a wheelchair. I said, Dr. Blount, that's what I've been begging them to let me do. I'll do fine in a wheelchair. 
And he finally convinced everybody to let him do it sitting down. And uh, doing it sitting down has been fun. After you were up recovering in Wisconsin at your mom's place, what was it that spurred you into getting back into your medical career? Was there, did she influence you or was there a family issue that stimulated you to get back to medicine? Well, during that time, and, and even when I was in rehab, um, I was trying to figure out what to do. What can I do in a wheelchair? And everybody tried to get me to be a, a radiologist, strong push for that. And in those days, radiologists just looked at x-rays day after day after day. They never even saw the patients. That, to me, that just wasn't what medicine was all about. And they wanted to suggest to being a physiatrist. As a matter of fact, I was accepted to the famous Rehab Institute in New York. Uh, and then I, but I, I wanted to do more than that. I, I don't know why. Uh, and Dr. Merck one day, who had cut my throat a few months earlier, said, you know, when you were on anesthesia, you loved it. I said, yeah, I did. I really enjoyed it. And he said, well, there's no place better to try it from a wheelchair than Cook County. And so I came back down to county from Milwaukee, and uh, you can get around all right. There are eight floors, but there are elevators and so on. Uh, and started what it, what I, what I liked about anesthesia that I didn't like about the others is you are with a patient and getting a patient through the most critical period of their lives. I mean, we all know that anesthesia is just that short of death, only it's controlled, general anesthesia, that is. And uh, that's when the patients really need you, uh, and, and uh, not so much to put them to sleep, it's to take care of their medical problems while they're asleep, having surgery. And so I had, there was no anesthesia residency there. And so once I convinced myself I could do it, I remember the last thing I had to do, one of, somebody had asked me, well, what about resuscitation? And I said, well, I, I've done that. Now in those days, Cook County still had the old white pipe beds, you know, with bars in them. So I'd just go up to the head of the bed and innovate them through the bars and uh, so on. So I wrote to five. I was still convinced that county hospitals are the way to go, where the volume of patients is there. So I wrote to L.A. County, Sam Denson, who wrote back, don't be ridiculous, you can't do anesthesia in a wheelchair. I wrote to uh, the lady who was the head of Philadelphia Charity Hospital, now closed, and I never heard from her. I wrote to John Adriani at Charity in New Orleans, and he immediately wrote me back, and he said, I'm coming to Chicago for a meeting. Meet me at the Pitt Congress Hotel. I met him. He said, you know what? I'm convinced you can do it. He said, but you're wasting time. This was January, I remember vividly. He said, I will go home to charity and ask the board to give me one position more just for the six months, and then you become one of the regular slots. And he got back, and as county boards are, they turned him down. But he wrote to me that I should stay where I was, that at, in a meeting in New York, he had seen Dr. Vince Collins, who was then at NYU, uh, but before that, he was in private practice. And uh, they had recruited him to come to Cook County to head up the anesthesia department. Now, until 
that moment, anesthesia was under surgery, as it was many places. Uh, but Dr. Collins sure didn't know what he was getting into. Uh, the powerful people there. But he came in, and I was working in the ORs uh, with all nurses. And of course, being a doctor, the nurses all would wave goodbye at 3 o'clock when they went home, and I'd have the Whipple or something that was going on for 12 hours. And uh, Dr. Collins called me into his office one day, and he said, well, he said, I've looked over your application. I've talked to the head of surgery, Dr. Preark. I've talked to his associate, Dr. Baker, who worked with you in the arm. And they said, you're, you're good. So I've decided I'll take you. And I said, oh, thank you very much, Dr. Collins. But what I thought was, if you don't take me, who the hell else are you going to take? Because there was nobody applying for a job. So I became the first resident at Cook County Hospital. And it was great. It was just like my internship. Got to do everything. Uh, literally everything. And Dr. Collins really fought an uphill battle, but he got the Department of Anesthesiology out from under surgery. Uh, anybody who sees this will remember Vince Collins is a tough little guy. And the head of the hospital, I mean the supreme god of the hospital, was a surgeon named Carl Meyer. We all lived in Carl Meyer Hall. And Dr. Collins had done a clever thing. Before he signed on at County, formally, he went and got civil service, took the exam. So Dr. Meyer didn't like it that Dr. Collins was trying to shape up this department. And so he called Dr. Collins into his office and he said, Sonny boy, he said, I think you're getting a little too big for your britches. Uh, I think you'd do better elsewhere. And Dr. Collins reached across his desk and grabbed him by the tie and shirt and lifted him out of his chair and said, I think I'll stay here, Dr. Meyer. I have civil service too. And that was the end of that. Dr. Collins was a great chief. Uh, and he recruited a great staff who I, I just learned they're all gone now but I just learned everything from I mean everything Trier Merck was interesting but came in well let me yeah Trier Merck came in one day to demonstrate this goes back before when I was an intern an intern there and he said today I'm going to demonstrate a break your block Ooh, that sounds exciting. That sounds neat. So he talks to this old gentleman who's having his arm worked on. And he gave us the technique. That in those days, they used what they call the rib walking technique. Uh, but he advocated it, more advocated it, and I guess probably maybe still do. And uh, he got through walking the rib and injecting, and he didn't even sat back and he said, now, we're through putting the medicine in, how do you feel? He said, fine. He said, I'm getting just a little tingly. No. He said, can you lift it? Yeah. And he lifted his arm. And he turned to us and said, now that is a beautiful failed brachial plexus block. Put him to sleep. I never forgot that. And it it does tie into my story because uh, when I'd worked my way up to being the chief resident, we finally did recruit other residents and some great great young guys. But I, we had a Cook County graduate school where clinicians could come in in various specialties and learn to do things they didn't know how to do in their practice. And Dr. Collins sort of brought with him what they'd been done out east uh, at NYU, he started a nerve block course. And so I had two jobs. I had, a, I, I forgot to say that before Dr. Collins got there, I took Dr. Moore's book, 
which, as you know, is written recipe style, this block and this block. And he repeats himself at each one so that you don't have to read the preface and then the introduction and so on. And so I, I knew my blocks, at least as they were done then. I had some questions about some of them. But Dr. Collins started this course for physicians at the Cook County Graduate School. And my job was to go over every evening and do dissect cadavers for the next day's class. They were there seven days. And when I started dissecting the cadavers, I started noticing things that weren't like they looked in the textbooks of anesthesia. More Benica, et cetera. It's strange. That because the nerves were were kind of wrapped up in fascia. But they really weren't wrapped up in fascia. They really were part of the way trapped between the fascia of two muscles. But still, it made me think, you know, if we could put a needle in that space where they're all invested with this fascia, we wouldn't have to do like Dr. Merck did, eight, ten injections and inject a lot of fluid. We could put a needle in like we do in the epidural space, fill it up with fluid, appropriate volume to be determined, and they ought to have anesthesia in the arm. And after a few of these courses and a few of these dissections, I was convinced of it enough to try it on a patient. A single needle stick at the, near the axillary artery, and we filled it up with local anesthetic, and we had a axillary plot. And that's really where I got started on regional. And it, it seemed to me, it had always seemed to me throughout my whole residency, why do we have to put the brain or depress the brain and the heart and the lungs and the liver and maybe even the spleen just to operate on some guy's hand so he doesn't feel it? We should be able to just put the arm to sleep or the leg to sleep. Now the leg's pretty easy. We got a lot of choices. You got spinal, you got epidural. But sometimes it might be nice to be able to block certain aspects of it and so on. So we focused on the arm and began doing brachial block. And the place that was the best to block was right here above the clavicle. We we thought anyway because the scalene fascia comes down, you know, and forms a tunnel. And then beyond that, it goes the axillary fascia. So all the way from where the nerves come out of the spine to the axilla, they're in this tube. So people had already stumbled onto that. I think the first article was, uh, on axillary block was written by an orthopedic surgeon, Preston Burnham, who was operating on a child who'd fallen, walking on a picket fence, fell and transected his axilla. And he made the comment, look how the nerves pouch out in that little fascial thing. And he did an axillary block with two cc's above and two cc's below the artery. Well, we weren't discovering anything then when we did the axillary block. But going above the clavicle, so-called supraclavicular block, which had been called supraclavicular block, instead of the multiple needle sticks, if, since there's such constant landmarks, the subclavian artery and the trunks of the plexus, you can, you can identify those and put one needle in there. So we did a couple hundred cases, and then we made models of the pulses, made a model, uh, actually cast one of our respiratory therapists in rubber and uh, peeled it off. But we had a model that we took to the ASA in 1964. 
my first experience at ASA. And you could put your finger on the pulse and feel where you do an axillary block and where you do a what we call subclavian perivascular block. Because while they're perivascular, I probably would have been better to call it interfascial. But that's how I got off on 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 doing those. And then some of the surgery residents that rotated on anesthesia said, well, why can't you go higher in that space? And I really didn't pay much attention to it uh, until we were started doing uh, carotids and so on. So we just followed that same groove between the muscles and came up with a cervical plexus block with a single needle stick. And it seems so much safer to use a single needle injection, if it's in the right place, of course, than to make, have to make multiple injections. And uh, we also wondered, even an axillary block, why do you go above and below the artery? If they're in this tube, and you ought to be able to fill the tube, just like we don't go in front and back of the epidural space. And so at least we reduced the blocks, brachial plexus blocks, to single block, single injection techniques. So Dr. Winnie, how did your new techniques and approaches to supraclavicular brachial plexus block essentially negate what John Adriani said? We all remember, of course. He said that when you approach the brachial plexus above the clavicle, we do so with a degree of fear and trepidation because the incidence of pneumothorax is so high. I think it was up to 6% published incidence at that time. And how did your preparation and determination of the perivascular compartment and a single injection technique obviate the, the risk of pneumothorax? Well, you know, the reason that they had those problems was they used skin landmarks. You measured the midpoint of the clavicle. Now you draw an X and you go about a centimeter above it. Well, everybody isn't the same size and everybody doesn't have the same musculature. So we thought that because our landmarks are muscular and vascular, that we could hit the target every time. And I, in my entire practice, I don't think I ever read, I've heard of them, but I don't think I've ever read a published case of a subclavian perivascular block done using that technique that caused the pneumothorax. I really don't. So Dr. Winnie, as we all conceptualize about this fascial arrangement and fascial compartment of the, the relationship of vasculature, nerves, and muscles, for example, in the upper extremity, did these concepts hold true when you started to investigate anatomically the lower extremity model as well? Well, when we, we'd sort of exhausted our approaches to the brachial block, uh, I, I had hoped I could find a way of doing something in the, in the, to block the, the leg the same way. And the concept's the same. We all learn what, what the anatomy was in the groin. And the nerve does not lie in the space with the artery and vein, which is kind of too bad because we could use that fashion. But again, it enters the groin in a, in between two muscles. So the fascia of those muscles, including the fascia that, that makes the inguinal ligament itself. And so we'd put a needle in there, finger on the artery, sort of like an axillary block in the groin, but you would have to go outside so you, you wouldn't go quite as close to the artery and you'd get a paresthesia of the nerve and then you'd inject your solution. And we put we would put digital pressure beneath the needle, hoping to prevent pre prevent retrograde flow or progressive flow, I guess it would be, and to enhance retrograde flow to go up and get that lumbar plexus. And we ultimately turned out we could get the three nerves of the lumbar plexus. This is still controversy today. But uh, getting the lumbar plexus alone is rarely enough. 
you know. So what we would do is a what they, we call a three-in-one block or a lumbar paravascular block uh, and a sciatic block. And uh, we had to, unfortunately, to do that, you'd have to turn the patient on his side. And uh, I failed to mention another thing that, that, that interests me. Since I have the floor, <laughs> um, the first paper I ever presented involved a technique that was because of the wheelchair. I uh, had, th before the residency started, I had three surgeons rotating through anesthesia. And they can do regional anesthesia, the nurses couldn't. So I would teach them how to do a spinal and an epidural, because that was what they needed to know. And they'd always get the orthopedics room and so on, because they didn't know how to do general yet. It took longer. And occasionally, a spinal or an epidural would wear off with the resident doing the anesthesia for some something in the leg, a resident doing the surgery, excuse me. So I'd come in the room, and now the patient's way up high on the old, uh, I don't remember what they called those frames, but fracture beds. And uh, so they had the, the upper part of them was on, the thorax was on one pain, and there's a space, and then the hips and the rest were on another uh, structure. So I said, well, give me the spinal kit. And I'd wheel under the patient and put the needle up into the spinal canal. And found out the patient is suspended. We always have them curl up when they're, we're doing spinals. They were suspended from their thoracic curve and their sacral curves. So they were maximally wide open spaces. and. Uh, we found that we could get in virtually every time on the first attempt. We left the needle in place throughout so that if it should wear off, we just had to go under and re-inject it. And uh, we did 200 cases that way and compared it with the 200 cases that we had done before that where you turn the patient on their side, get a spinal, wait till the spinal worked, and then we'd thrust the patient out of the fracture table. Well, invariably, these are elderly people that thump onto the fracture table and you take their blood pressure and it was gone. And then you'd do, give them all sorts of pressures and it would come back. And uh, we didn't do that. We put them on the table and it, we found if you keep traction on that fractured hip, it didn't hurt all that much. And uh, when we looked at the data, it was just mind-boggling. The mortality rate using what we called a supine spinal was 50 percent less than the mortality rate when we did the spinal and then put the patient on the table. And we presented that in a paper at the AMA section on anesthesia, which no longer has clinical meetings. And uh, they published it in the Journal of the American Medical Association. That was my first publication ever before I got off into these wonderful blocks that I became enwrapped in. And Dr. Winnie, at about this time, wasn't it true that Dr. Ted Hartman came over to the county to become the chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery? And with him, he brought some novel concepts, including what Gardner and others had done at the, at the Cleveland Clinic by injecting corticosteroids into the epidural space to treat things like radiculopathy and other muscular dystrophies, for example, and other random neurological uh, concepts. Kind of an interesting story, and I'll try to be brief. We had a little old lady with a fractured humerus. She had tuberculosis with a cavity with fluid in it. So we wanted to do a, uh, 
a break your block on her. And I had not yet met Ted Hartman, who was just recruited to be the chief of orthopedics. So I went ahead and did the block myself. Well, I was a resident. No, I was, I was an attending. But I did the block. And at that moment, I just had pulled the needle out. Dr. Hartman came in and introduced himself. He was a great guy, great gentleman. And he, like many good surgeons, he held the lady's arm because the lady had a fractured arm. And as he sat there chatting with me, about uh, he's from Cleveland Clinic and I've been here, he said, this arm's getting relaxed. And I said, yeah, I did a block. He said, yeah, but it's working. Hmm. He was really, really amazed at that. And uh, so we became good friends over that. And he was talking to me over the ether shield about, he said to me one day, have you ever, are you injecting steroids here for, for herniated discs? I said, Ted, we only do what we understand. Nobody seems to know how that works and if it works. Of course, we put people to sleep every day and we don't know how, understand how that works. And we talked about it a couple times, but it didn't sound like a very realistic approach to the problem. And then one of my nurse anesthetists, who was four feet, five feet four and weighed about 180 pounds, was off work for a while, and Ted brought her to me and said, you want to put her to sleep for surgery or do you want to try the epidural steroids? I said, I'll try the epidural steroids. She said, terrible operative risk, anesthetic risk. So we turned Jean on her side, put the epidural in, put in the steroid, and uh, pulled out, never thinking it was going to do anything. And I called her back 24 hours later. I said, how are you doing? She said, oh, it's like heaven. I said, what? She said, the pain's almost totally gone. In another 24 hours, it was gone. And she continued to work at the county for 25 more years before she died. And she never had a recurrence or, or anything. So this was not humbug. This was reality. So we began to set up a series of cases uh, who we would get from the orthopods uh, because of Dr. Hartman. Uh, he had seen this technique done at the Cleveland Clinic by some neurosurgeons. And he himself, I don't think, was sure it was really working. Uh, but he worked with us and sent us the cases. And it worked. It worked a lot. didn't work in everybody. Obviously, the earlier you got it, the better the chance it would work. And we had to work out the details of the systemic effect of the, the, um, of the drug we're injecting. Uh, so we never exceeded three tries within any uh, three-month period. And uh, that also led to some publications and uh, was picked up by people as soon as we published it. And more and more and more and more and epidural steroids is still used widely today. And if it weren't for my being a county and Ted Hartman coming there, I don't think it would have continued because the neurosurgeons at the Cleveland Clinic just weren't interested in continuing that work. Dr. Whitty, I think that probably historically we all have to agree that you're one of the pioneers of intrathecal administration of steroids. It's a very controversial topic, and yet you've promoted it throughout these decades. Can you elaborate on that for us, please? Well, I, I still think it's a very effective way to go. In our litigious society, 
uh, one almost never does it. But I have, on occasion, when we started to reduce doing that, explain carefully to a patient what might go wrong as a side effect, uh, and inject it intrathecally. And I think, in the long run, intrathecal might be slightly more effective than epidural, but I don't think that today probably we should do more than epidural steroids. But it's a great technique and shows that you can really be wrong with your initial observations on the technique. It's kind of interesting on that, along those lines of epidural steroids, Dr. Hartman went on to move to Lubbock, Texas, not only to start the Department of Orthopedics there, but ultimately to become dean there. And he called me up uh, three years later. He said, Al, are you still injecting steroids uh, for discs? And I said, yeah, sure, of course. He said, that's a cervical disc. He said, I said, that's okay, we've done them. And he came back all the way from Texas to get an epidural steroid. And we gave him one, and I saw him, he's now 90, I saw him recently, uh, and he, um, he never had a recurrence. I had one other thing I have to tell you. The chief of surgery came down one day and said he had a herniated disc cervical. And he was really not wanting to have an injection in the neck, but he didn't want surgery. And so I got him on the table, got him, you know, lying face down and on an angle and tilted his head. And he kept saying, Al, that's you, not the resident. And I said, yes, it's me, Bob. Don't worry about it. And so I said, now I'm going to give you something this skin. And as we went through the steps, he kept, he kept kibitzing and asking, what are you doing? What are you doing? Tell me where you are. I said, I'll tell you what you can do to help. You want to help? He says, yes. I take the one arm that's free and put it up to your larynx. And if you feel a needle sticking you in the finger, I've gone too far. He didn't say another word. He got a good block. And he, too, was cured and still is cured. Well, it certainly seems you practice what you preach, Dr. Winnie, because in addition to doing some of the first cervical epidural steroid injections in the country, maybe in the world, you were also a recipient of cervical epidural steroid injections. What did that feel like? What was that like? I, lo I, I had lost the use of one arm and uh, just in agony. And uh, so I came in, and I think I had Dr. Durrani, who was then had been one of my residents, uh, and he did an epidural steroid on me. And because of the polio, that was pretty hairy because I had a lot of ossification around, you know, making that space even smaller. But he got right in and um, injected it, and it was, it was pretty dramatic. But I, can remember, I remember the date, it was 1988 when I got my last injection, I think by Dr. Durrani as well. I had several different occurrences. And in those days, we didn't have uh, patient monitors, PCAs, so that if it hurt, you could give yourself a little uh, injection. So my PCA, was my interviewer, Dr. Candido. He actually sat with me and would, and would give me one milligram of morphine and intermittently until I would stop hurting. And then he, you, would snooze in the chair until I said, oh, it's starting to hurt again. So he, he gave me another a little shot of her of, of, of drug, and at 18 hours, 
the drug was gone for good. But uh, I thank you belatedly for getting me through that night. That was uh, a real experience. Do you remember that? I remember it very well. Your snoring actually kept me awake all night no, to be no, able to sure give you that, that morphine shot every hour or so. I certainly do remember it fondly, I should add. Dr. Winnie, among your many contributions to medicine, you were the founding father of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. What was going through your mind at that time, and how did you get together with a bunch of colleagues or people with like-minded ideas and say, let's make this world-class entity, this world-class organization that's going to educate thousands of clinicians throughout the world on concepts of regional anesthesia and ultimately pain medicine as well? Well, it didn't all go that, that quickly, but um, because I, I thought about doing something. As I began to lecture at other places, uh, I found that the, these people really weren't getting any regional anesthesia at all in their training. Our residents at County were getting a lot of it, then at County, and then at, later at Illinois. And so I began to, you know, go around and lecture to people uh, about that, about how to do these techniques, uh, which was kind of nice because I got to know make a lot of friends uh, because you get invited to various universities and and teach with them. And they'd always put you with a resident or so to teach him how to do it. And I finally refused and said I want an attending because I want somebody in the department to keep teaching this and keep teaching it. And then I guess Illinois was just desperate. They couldn't find a chairman or something. Uh, and I was invited to come over and talk to them. And in 1972, as you said, I was 40 years old. Uh, I became chairman of, uh, part of the deal was it had been a division of surgery of a separate department of anesthesiology. So just going there did some good for anesthesia. And uh, it was a pretty rudimentary that the chairman was gone and the um, the chair was was being held uh, temporarily by an Oriental surgeon who had been there, and but he didn't have a license, so he couldn't sign anything for the chairman, and it was really a mess. I think about three or four attendings and 22 residents we started with. And uh, it was an uphill climb. Uh, naturally, by this time, I was doing a lot of lecturing around the country, and I ran into lots of people with the ASA. And uh, I think I chaired the first Committee on Pain or Committee on Regional Anesthesia at the ASA, but became uh, involved in ASA politics. But what bothered me in the back of my head, my mind was, how can we let the guys who are out there, most of the anesthesiologists, thousands and thousands of them, didn't use regional anesthesia, maybe a spinal, maybe an epidural, and that was it. And I did a lot of exhibits on regional, and frequently, at, including, especially at the ASA, and many times I was next to a guy, an Indian guy named Raj. And I said, you know, I've got this idea. I think we should form an American Society of Regional Anesthesia where the people out in practice can come to our meetings and learn to do these techniques. And he said, boy, that sounds like a great idea. And and this is over a period of two or three years, of course, and uh, I would talk to more people. And it finally came to a head. I was examining for the old American College of Anesthesiologists in New York. And you know, you get a break every once in a while. And I mentioned it to Harold Karen and uh, said, what do you think? about this idea. Oh, he said, that's a fantastic idea. 
Carol Karen had served as secretary of the ASA for, I don't know, 20 years or something like that, but was now at Virginia, University of Virginia. And then um, uh, he, I happened to, that what we were all gathered around a coffee pot pouring coffee, and uh, Don Breidenbaugh was there. And he said he thought that was a great idea. So a year or so later, Don and uh, Harold were both on the ASA Board of Directors, which was held here in Chicago. And so they said, why don't we get together and let's, let's, let's move on this thing. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm chafing at the bit. So we got together and we decided what we were going to do. And we were going to make it a place dedicated to teaching regional anesthesia. We expected a lot of, you know, comments like, well, there's no American Society of General Anesthesia. Well, that, there isn't because everybody does general anesthesia. But uh, we had our first meeting. Uh, we all wagered on how many people we would get to come. Uh, I'll tell you, another group that was very helpful was the trustees of the of anesthesia and analgesia. Now, we asked them if we could. The uh, IARS meetings always ran and up to Thursday, actually cut off for some reason Thursday at noon. So people could maybe come to our meeting, and we asked if it was all right if we could advertise our meeting would start at noon on Thursday and run through the weekend. And they not only said it was all right, they said, we will advertise your meeting free of charge in what was then the Yellow Journal. And they did. And at the first meeting, we got 300 attendees. And we put together committees that literally went around uh, from place to place teaching uh, people to do it on, on models and so on. And uh, it, be it became very, very rewarding and very successful. Uh, and it, it began to really grow. There were a lot of people who needed the ASRA. And it, it's, of course, today there's many, many thousands of members. Our first meeting was 300. Dr. Winnie, in about 1983, you wrote what is without question the Bible of brachial plexus block. And in the last 27 years, nobody's come close to duplicating or reproducing or remanufacturing that concept on paper. I guess my question is, with the advent of ultrasound and the popularity of ultrasound in the last several decades, basically, do you believe that that's fundamentally changed the concepts that you've delineated and all the work that you did to establish the fundamental anatomical principles upon which brachial plexus block is based? Well, I can't speak to ultrasound per se, but I think that, uh, let me summarize it succinctly by saying that the techniques we were using were before the advent of neurostimulation and ultrasound. And that, but as anesthesia, as regional anesthesia grew, more and more people were involved, and more and more people were thinking about better ways to do it. And I think both neurostimulation and ultrasound are vast improvements. However, I truly believe that a resident going through a residency should know how to do blocks using the old finger on the artery or, and needle and paresthesia technique and the neurostimulus technique and the ultrasound because right now one of the most exciting things to do with regional anesthesia and pain is the use of it at the battlefront. As you know, there was an article in Time recently. One of my good friends, who was chief at Walter Reed, went over there and put in continuous blocks into young wounded men. Instead of their getting morphine and 
vomiting and still hurting. These young men were flown from the battlefield to Germany. One of them had two more operations under the same catheter and went back to Walter Reed and had three more operations under the same catheter. So I think that it, these newer techniques uh, are, are fantastic, but you're not going to have ultrasound in the battlefield always or in any hospital you may not have it. Uh, or you may not have a nerve stimulator if you're in roadside injuries and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think I still think that all of the techniques contribute to the betterment of, of regional anesthesia and anesthesia in general. But with ultrasound, for example, it's like having a GPS versus having to previously learn the actual pathways or the, or the roads. Do you foresee that some of the newer trainees will look at this as a method for taking an easier or softer way to get to a target without learning all the concepts and all the principles that you devised? Yeah, I'm afraid so. If It depends on their, uh, their teaching, who teaches them. If, they, if, they, if they're taught properly, they'll get all three tech ways of doing something. Uh, it's the, um, the complete angler, so to speak. Dr. Winnie, your contributions to regional anesthesia and pain medicine are legendary. The world knows of them. But what the world doesn't necessarily know is that you made some very substantial contributions to other principles of local anesthetics, for example, and other anesthetic adjuvant agents that are used on a daily basis throughout operating rooms in the entire world. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Well, I, I think one of the reasons I went into anesthesia was because of the, uh, into, re, into academic anesthesia. Instead of having to be in the OR all day, and that's all I did, you got to do some OR work and some lecture work and some research. And I think some of the research uh, was extremely enjoyable and uh, added to our knowledge. I, I uh, was the first, our institution in Cook County was the first given propranolol. And at the time, it, it, it's one of the most beta blockers, or one of the most wonderful drugs we've come along with. And of course, they've progressed too. But in those days, I mean, I had, in, in my experience at Cook County, uh, stop many ventricular tachycardias that would have possibly otherwise died with a single shot of propranolol, and it was so controversial at first. Uh, Jim Ekinoff stood up at the World Congress, or European Congress, and said that drug has no place in anesthesia. And we know that those types of drugs, rather than just propranolol, but um, I worked with that for a long time, I worked with a, for 10 years I did research with a drug called doxapram, and I still believe it has a place, though minor, in the anesthetic, or in the post-anesthetic period. When people, we know that you get miliary atelectasis, everybody does, and the healthy, it doesn't matter, they survive it, but uh, it was a way of making somebody sigh if you will, or take deep breaths when it was painful to do so. And we studied that drug and compared it with all other stimulants because virtually all of the other stimulants were drugs that had, uh, well, they had so much central action that if you gave too much, they would convulse. And this drug was quite different. It just made you suddenly deep breathe and uh, briefly and it would go away. And so, uh, our chief of surgery was scrubbing in one day, and he said, you talk so much about how this helps the patient sigh post-op, why don't you call it the pharmacologic sigh? And uh, it, 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 that was another piece of work that I enjoyed. Of course, a lot of the research really had to do with the development of the blocks. You were in on some of that. In the later years, look, thinking of new ways to use blocks and new places that we could block. 
I have to tell you something that probably would surprise you. I think the greatest research enjoyment I ever had was the last research project I did. Uh, I worked with the chief of anatomy at uh, University of Illinois, George Pappas, who had learned how to culture adrenal medullary tissue. And he intended to inject it into brain for Parkinsonism. Uh, and uh, that didn't work out in his hands, in his lab. So he started injecting it in animals, of course, into the spinal canal. And it seemed to have some remarkable actions. So we actually would harvest, when one went down to get the kidney for a renal transplant, they threw away the adrenal. We kept it, cultivated it, cultured it for 20 days to see to it. It was still putting out not only epinephrine and norepinephrine, but it also put out four or five morphine-like substances. And then we would, uh, they, the techs would cut them into one millimeter cubes. I, with a big 15-gauge two-way needle, would put it into the spinal canal, and we injected those cells. Those cells would hook onto the, the pia, usually in the axilla of each nerve, and continue to produce their products. And we saw, in a preliminary study we did, which is all we could do, uh, we saw patients who were dying of cancer in absolute agony, not responding to anything, and this made them pain-free, totally pain-free, and they died pain-free. And um, that, that was very satisfying. As, as I'm sure you know, I'd, I'd been interested in pain. Uh, when I said Dr. Collins started that pain clinic, I continued it. And our residents all got trained in pain, and I think that's how you and I first got started when you became a resident and then a fellow in our pain clinic at Illinois. So um, pain management, I think, goes hand in hand. Anesthesiologists are really the right people. I don't think there should be a one-man show. I think you've got to integrate it with the other specialists that we all need. But um, pain management's been a, one of the more rewarding parts of my career. What advice would you give either individuals just coming out of medical school who might approach you and say, Dr. Winnie, should I go into anesthesiology? Or those graduates of anesthesiology residency programs who might seek your advice and counseling in terms of pursuing advanced training and, and fellowship training in pain medicine or regional anesthesia? Well, uh, let me speak to those who are graduating from anesthesia training. Sure. You have to make a decision whether you want to go out into clinical practice and do what you were trained to do and take care of people and make a nice living, or would you rather get into the teaching end of it, where in reality you're treating many more patients than you could individually because you're teaching those who are then going to go out and take care of patients. And I think that, that my choosing academic anesthesia was so exciting because, as I said, you, you don't do the same thing. You do some teaching, you do some clinical, you do some research, and if you're lucky, you get well-known and you get invited uh, to speak around the world and you develop friends all over. I think uh, the greatest rewards of what I chose, academic anesthesia, are twofold. One is the the knowledge that you helped send hundreds and hundreds of young people out to take care of patients who need anesthesia or pain management. And the other is I've been invited, been fortunate enough to be invited all over the Western world anyway. And you come away with that kind of a career 
with friends everywhere. As a matter of fact, it's almost too bad because I've got friends in every country in Europe. I mean, close friends. And you don't get to see them like you do friends in your own neighborhood. And uh, so yeah, I've had a wonderful life, and I've, I've been able to have time to pursue my other interests, which is writing music and writing poetry. And uh, I guess the rest is history. Dr. Winnie, you've won so many accolades and so many awards throughout your distinguished career, which spans at least four decades. You've won the McQuiston, the Ralph Waters, the Gaston Labatt, all from, and from the ASRA, as well as the Distinguished Service Award. Was there any award maybe that you didn't receive that you had thought you ought to have gotten or maybe that you would have liked to have received before you retired? No, I, you don't really think about award. You're always surprised when somebody picks you to receive an award. I'm, I'm most proud, not most proud, but I mean, I was extremely proud that I was uh, made an honor, or, or made a member of the Royal College of the Fellowship, the Fellow of Anesthesia of the Royal College of Surgeons, which is now Fellowship of Anesthesia, and of the Fellowship of, the, of Anesthesia of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, which is now FANSCA in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, uh, when I first went to Europe uh, to give my very first lecture in Europe at the World Congress, uh, everybody that came to the lecture, well, I didn't realize that they knew about the techniques that I'd introduced, and I became very embarrassed because they were talking about Winnie One and Winnie Two blocks, and so they called them different things than I did. But I think that's that's one of the has been one of the greatest parts of my life is the the uh, getting to to know so many great friends, great people in anesthesia, not just in our country where I have many, many good friends in, in the various departments, and many good friends who were protégés of mine. Uh, so it, it's been a wonderful life. I've been very fortunate, and that I've always said, may sound a little corny, people have asked me, weren't you how do you feel about having to be in the wheelchair? Wouldn't, why didn't you get downtrodden? And I said, you know, I never had a depressed day in my life. And I thank Roy Heath at Princeton for that ability, I guess. But you know, if you think about it, if I hadn't gotten polio, I wouldn't have gone into anesthesia. And who knows what I'd be doing. I may never have had the wonderful life that I've had. Furthermore, I've always, I've told several audiences when I was getting an award, because I was always afraid when I talked about it that they would think I was feeling sorry for myself. I would tell them, just remember, it's great to accomplish something, but when you accomplish it in a wheelchair, it's much greater satisfaction because it was a little harder to do and because sometimes you had to lean on friends to do it. And it really is true. Uh, I'd like to walk like everybody else walks, but anybody can walk, but it really is the wheelchair has done a lot for me, and uh, I'm very thankful to be asked to give this opportunity to be grateful. Dr. Winnie, I'm really grateful to have been associated with you professionally for all these years and for your continuing input into my professional development. And I want to thank you especially for taking time out with us today to share your fascinating life 
and to explore with us the immense contributions that you've made on behalf of anesthesiologists throughout the world. I would also like to thank the Wood Library Museum for extending this opportunity to us and for the committee, including Dr. Bradley E. Smith and Dr. Marcel Willock, uh, subcommittee chair, for making this all worthwhile and happen. Thank you so much.